Hello again. In case you haven't met me before, my name is Cathy Johnson and I'm a deacon in the Richmond and Hounslow circuit. I want to thank you for joining me today. This week we are looking at exile and wilderness. And today we're going to be looking at the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, but as related by Luke. I've put the link below this video and also the links to the same story in Mark and Matthew, in case you want to look at those too. Or you can just take my word for it, that Mark is extremely brief, whilst Matthew and Luke are very similar in the detail that they record. The fact that this episode is not one that John has chosen to include may also be quite telling, as we shall consider briefly in a little while. But I've decided on the Luke reading over Matthew because I'm interested in where Luke places this incident in his particular gospel. And we'll be reading the first part of chapter four. Whilst Mark speeds through this wilderness experience, connecting it directly with Jesus's baptism, and Matthew, although giving us more detail about the two events, also puts them immediately together. Luke punctuates his story. Between the baptism and the temptation in the wilderness, he gives us Jesus's earthly ancestry, going right back from Joseph to Adam. Why is this? Well, it could be that we're being reminded that at the baptism, Jesus was affirmed by a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, identifying him as the son of God but Jesus was also human. That's a mystery that we believe as Christians, that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. And after this event in the wilderness, Luke tells us that Jesus, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, quotes Isaiah in the, in the synagogue and impresses everyone with his authority. Until someone starts questioning how he can possibly speak that way when he's only Joseph's, Joseph the carpenter's son. Things go severely downhill from there and the people try unsuccessfully to push him off a cliff. I think Luke tells us this story in a very particular way to guide us to understand what sort of saviour Luke thinks Jesus is. So as I start reading from chapter 4 verse 1, hold the thought that Luke has just told us that Jesus has been affirmed as the Son of God, and it's also just the latest in a line of men traceable back to Adam. Luke 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. I'm going to stop there just, just for a moment because I want to draw your attention to a couple of points. Firstly, Jesus has gone into the wilderness. We know from other parts of the gospel that when he wanted to rest up, when he wanted to spend time with God, he went up mountains. This is a very different environment. Whenever wilderness is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's linked with struggle suffering in a harsh place and a sense of searching for purpose and for God. Think of the exodus of the Israelites with their construction of an idol and their grumbling, their mistakes and their doubts. Of Hagar wandering aimlessly when she's banished by Abraham and of Moses just biding his time taking care of another man's livestock. This is a very different sort of withdrawal. And maybe we are supposed to feel a sense that Jesus is wrestling with something or is not sure of the way ahead. So pausing for a moment to think about that. Are there times in your life that you can identify as wilderness times? Times when you have felt that your purpose is not clear or you've lost sight of what's important in your life or you've doubted that God cares for you. 
These may have been times that have been brief or, like me, you may be able to look back over your life and see that there was a long time of searching for meaning, for purpose, for truth. For me, ironically, my life began to change irreversibly when I was 40 and my dad, whom I loved very much, died. 40 is a significant number for me personally, but 40 is also the number of years the Israelites were said to have wandered in the wilderness and the number of days it rained on Noah's Ark and 40, the 40 days that the Ark rested on the mountain top before Noah sent out the raven and dove on a reconnaissance mission. This is a significant time of formation. Even Mark mentions this time in the wilderness, although he's so quick to move on we almost miss it. When I look back on my life, I realise that the time of searching and struggle was formative. It wasn't wasted time. It helped to shape the person I am now, the person God has called. But going back to the scripture, note that Jesus is led there by the Spirit. We always refer to Jesus in the wilderness, but we know that the Spirit is there too because it says so. And there's an implication too that the Father is not absent either. As in the Old Testament, God is always there in the wilderness for the Israelites, for Hagar and for Moses. Continuing with our earlier thoughts, have you been aware that when you have hit a low part in your life, God is there, ready to show you that you are precious, that you do have purpose, that God loves you? Sometimes that just comes through a sense of peace, sometimes in the guise of someone you know, or maybe events just gradually unfold in ways that you couldn't foresee and problems that seem insurmountable begin to melt away. So what was this Bible passage about? Well, I think it's informative that John, who does include some of the important events in Jesus's ministry, just like the other Gospels, and mentions too that John the Baptist was baptising and Jesus was there, doesn't tell us anything about this incident in the wilderness. Is this because John's Jesus is so full of authority that he's never broken by any of his experiences, even crucifixion, and so struggle of any sort doesn't really fit in with the image that John wants to give us? And a desperate struggle does ensue as Jesus, starving after days in the wilderness, is tempted. So I'll carry on reading verses 3 to 12. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their authority and their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now I could say a lot about this and there are a lot of commentaries out there. But I just want to go into this a little briefly because I don't have very long today. So my first question is, was the devil a real person or the adversary in Jesus's mind? Does it matter? Does it matter to you? I think because the devil doesn't appear anywhere else, this implies that this battle with evil is a wrestling inside Jesus, in his conscience. You may disagree with that view, but Jesus is about to begin his ministry he has to decide what sort of saviour he is to be. He has the power of God, but the limitations of humanity. 
So I think what's important here is that the offers that are made at the end of this formative time and the way in which Jesus dismisses them using quotes from scripture, Deuteronomy to be exact. Jesus doesn't really argue. He merely states the most basic of the laws for following God faithfully. Each temptation challenges Jesus to decide who he is. And simultaneously, we're encouraged to decide who the God is in whom we believe. Although these look like very practical challenges, creating food from rocks, reigning over all the kingdoms of the earth, and throwing himself off a high tower so that the angels can catch him, they're actually challenges to the first three commandments given to Moses in Exodus 20 and expanded upon in Deuteronomy 6, which is what Jesus quotes. God should be at the centre of life, of the life of someone who loves God, not their, own, not their own needs. Only God should be worshipped, not the pursuit of wealth, power and status. And not taking God's name in vain means not testing out his love by doing things we know are wrong just to see if God saves us. Do we manage to live this way? With God central, not pursuing other things, having other idols, and do we test God out? Well, if you're thinking you'll fall short, then join the club that is humanity. I think this goes to the heart of what Luke is trying to convey. Human beings are flawed, and from the beginning of the Bible, we're given stories that show how hard it is for them, and for us, to live the life God planned at creation. Sometimes things go spectacularly wrong. But Jesus is truly human and yet truly divine. And he conquers these temptations and it sets him up for the rest of his ministry, even to his death and resurrection. This passage finishes. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. They do say, don't they, that what doesn't break you makes you stronger. And Jesus is filled with the Spirit's power as he returns to begin his ministry in earnest. It transpires that he needs this inner strength because, as I said earlier, he's rejected in Galilee and finds himself in a dangerous situation. But in those couple of verses, there's also this underlying threat that the devil has only finished with him for the time being. I actually find that quite reassuring, that Jesus is tempted, Jesus conquers those temptations, but they haven't gone away. They are there, ready to return. And for me as a human being, I do find that quite reassuring because there are a number of times I've decided, resolved firmly not to do something that I know is not right. And then finding myself maybe months later doing exactly the same thing again. The gospel writers don't specifically mention temptations of Jesus again in the way they have here. But I'm sure you can think of times when Jesus must have been tempted, maybe to save himself by turning away from Jerusalem and going to hide to give himself longer to minister to people. Maybe to stir up his followers to become a powerful force for good against an oppressive regime. Or to derail God's plan for him by, by avoiding death on the cross. Let's face it, he is the son of God. He didn't need to go through any of that to prove his power. But this time in the wilderness has given him a clarity that he carries with him right until the end. I wonder where this takes your thoughts. There are so many other strands that I could have pulled out of this and a lot of the commentaries have gone into a great deal of detail about the various temptations and how Jesus answers. But the thought I'm left with is that Jesus turned his face at that very moment 
in all his ministry led towards Jerusalem, to his death and resurrection. It prepared him for the saviour that he needed to be. Many of us are willing to make sacrifices for those we love. But sacrificing our will to God's will can be extremely hard. And our love tends to have boundaries and conditions that we impose. God's love knows no boundaries. I invite you to pray with me before we end this session. Loving God, whose care is without boundary and whose kindness is limitless, we thank you that you sent your son to be an example to us and to minister, live, die and rise again so that we could know you and find eternal life. Help us through times that are a struggle and give us the wisdom to see such moments as formative rather than a waste. Send your spirit to show us how to bring you into the very centre of our lives. Forgive us when we follow those things in life that do not bring you glory. Love of wealth, status, power. When we test you, show us a better way. We thank you that, flawed though we are, we can have the confidence to come before you knowing that our sins are forgiven when we admit them and resolve not to repeat them. We pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for sharing this time with me. It's been a pleasure to go through this reading with you.